co-founder of Google Certified Leading Edge Certifications, uh, Apple Certified Educator, Distinguished Educator, Media Festival, Student Media Festival. Of course, you probably all know him as the former CEO of Q. If you've been to a Q conference, if you haven't, you need to go. This is an amazing experience. Your life will be changed. So please make sure that you go. Uh, received many, many, many awards. And we are very pleased to welcome this morning Mr. Michael Lawrence. Thank you. Uh, there's one person. Thank you. There's one person Chris forgot to get forget uh, to, to thank, and that's Chris. We gotta thank Chris. This wouldn't happen without Chris. I appreciate your time. I'm bummed about the California uh, Parks session, so let me give you a real quick tip. It is like the most amazing free thing that no one knows about. You can have a free field trip, virtual field trip, from your classroom to any one of the 200 plus California state parks. The program is called PORTS, and it's an acronym. I don't know what it stands for anymore, but it started 20 years ago. And if you go to, if you Google California state parks and the word PORTS, P-O-R-T-S, all the info will come up. It's a great crew, and they do it for free for California educators. They even do it for educators outside of the state. I told them they should charge for that, but they generally don't. Uh, but don't spread the word outside of California, because it's an amazing resource. So I'm bummed that that session got canceled. But do Google that, and then sign up. It's an amazing resource that far too few educators use. The other thing I wanted to point out about that hashtag, um, we talk about technology and how to use it so much, sometimes we forget to say why. And I love hashtags, and one of my favorite uses of hashtags, if you're new to the Twitterverse and, and using hashtags, is a great way to find your tribe. It's a great way to find your community. I will go to an event, I find out the hashtag, and then I'll search for that hashtag, and I'll look who's talking about that event, and I'll follow them, because that, those are interesting people, right? You are interesting people, because you're here on a Saturday, and you can follow each other virtually through Twitter and other social media using that hashtag. Obviously then, you also use it to share your insights. Oh my gosh, I didn't know about this California Ports program. And then you can post it, use the hashtag, others will learn about it that aren't even here. So those are two of the really cool uses of hashtags. So I thought I'd just dive into that for a second just to make sure that everyone here knows that. So this is me, and, and Chris was kind enough to talk about some of the exciting things. I do like the, the forced four by three perspective because I look skinnier. <laughs> It's super cool. So John, just a quick tidbit. It's four by three, it forces it. I made the slides again in four by three and then it made it even smaller. So don't go ahead and just leave it at 16 by nine. Yeah, so I used to get confused for this guy. Uh, actually, it happened. I was at a hotel, I was checking in at a hotel and I, there was a woman in front of me checking in and the lady was checking her in and then she noticed someone was in line and she did a full on double take and then realized how obvious it looked. And so then she felt compelled to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I thought for a moment you were Ricky Gervais. And the lady that she was checking in turned around and said, that's not Ricky Gervais, that's Mike Lawrence. And, <laughs> and I was blown away. It was, I was checking in for an ed tech conference the next morning and she was a Q member and so she recognized me from that. But it remains probably one of the highlights of my life. When I was recognized over Ricky Gervais, but then I changed, uh, I changed my eyeglasses, and now I'm starting to get this amazing uh, Golden Globe-winning actor Gary Oldman now, which I don't mind, even though he's older than me. That's fine. Um, I, I, it's an amazing actor. So that's me. I'm really glad you guys came and you could join me today. Who loves Bob Ross? Any Bob Ross fans in the audience? Talk to your kids about Bob Ross because there are memes about this guy and the kids love him. And I was totally surprised to find out my 10-year-old and my 15-year-old were big Bob Ross fans. And so for Christmas, instead of having the Yule Log, we put on Bob Ross. And they loved it. It was fantastic. So, uh, so there's Bob. And uh, I have some visual puns if we have time. How many know this? Anyone know this? Visual pun? In the back, yes? Assault and battery, ladies and gentlemen. She got it right. So we have a few more of these. Uh, they're on a timer. How many knows it? This is an easy one. I'll give you an easy one. The next one, however, not so easy. See if you can do this. This is just an excuse so I can drink some coffee. You know, I heard someone say it. Scramble eggs. Scramble eggs. Okay, well, we don't need to do all of these. That was an infinity pool. This is super hard. Bonus points, you get this. Helium is a... Yeah, and what is he, he, he? Laughing gas. Ding, ding. 
keys to happiness. This one no one gets. It's negative space. <laughs> Easy. Mood swings. I added this one just because of its timeliness. Putin on the roots. It is Putin on the beats. Any Harry Potter fans? It's a tech, a tech thing. Snake Jack. Very nice. Very nice. Well done. Another tech thing. You too. Well done. Okay, so you guys got them all. I don't need to show you the reveal. Let me just jump to the end here. Um, and we'll do this one. Here we go. So this has become my motto. I turn coffee into education. Is anyone else? This, this motto, you're watching it happen right now. Live. We're turning it into education. So, uh, so I wanted to talk about maverick leadership. And I, and I want to be careful. I'm not talking about maverick administrators necessarily. I'm talking about maverick leadership. Do you all believe that teachers, you can be leaders and you are leaders every day? Yes? Yes? Okay, I'm the only one raising my hand, but, but you're with me. You would agree. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to talk about several examples that through this uh, career that Chris just listed off, I had the opportunity to work with some amazing people, leaders in their own right, in the work that they are doing that have inspired me. And so I thought I'd share some of those with you and some of the choices they made, some of the changes they've been able to bring about in the students' lives, which is extraordinary, and I uh, wanted to share those with you. So just a quick word about change first. So this photo was taken just outside of New Orleans. i got to catch up my breath here. I'm too excited. <laughs> this was taken in 1915 at the Vachon facility just outside of New Orleans in Louisiana. And I'm not a scientist, right? I taught English when I taught. Uh, but I'm fairly certain this represents one horsepower, this vehicle. Right? We agree with that? One horsepower. Okay. Notice the smokestacks. Do you see those stacks? Okay, that was from an abandoned facility. Even in 1915, the facility was no longer in use. But notice the smokestacks. I'm going to fast forward 50 years, 1965. See the smokestacks? Same location, 50 years later, 1965. And that is a uh, Saturn One rocket being prepped for launch at the Meshach facility, which became an assembly facility for rockets. And that is 32 million horsepower, I'm told. We have to believe that, I don't know for sure. So that, in just the space of 50 years, represents tra dramatic transformation from one horsepower to, to 32 million horsepower in the space of 50 years. And that kind of pace of change is only quickening. And so, so what happened? Channel laid off. Take a moment, and I'll give you a chance to talk to each other. What do you, what are your reactions to that video as an educator? What are your reactions to that video? Take 30 seconds, I'll set a timer, find a buddy, if there are two, and have a quick huddle on that. A couple of quick reflections. Who's willing to share? What are the thoughts that they or their buddy had? Raise your hand. You want to share your thoughts? I've got a couple. Yes, to the back. It was sad. sad. Yeah, I think the music didn't help, right? <laughs> okay, so we went to the, right to the Terminator. Sorry, the last thing you said? Okay, so that's an interesting point. Was there any human interaction or not? There was one. What was it? The little girl, right? She just kind of waved, and then there was a brief wave back, right? So they were still that, but that's the only human interaction. And even the pet was a robot, right? So, um, so yes, that's an interesting point. But you're right, limited human interaction. Yeah. Um, other thoughts? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, what does that translate to in 20 in 2018? Is that do we need to have coding? Do we should we really embrace this code.org? Computer Science Teachers Association and that sort of thing, the code CS for all efforts. That's one run certainly one direction. I would I would agree with that. That I think that we need to be more aware, and our children need to be more aware of what goes into all these machines that we depend so much on. Other thoughts? Uh, yes, good. And then we'll come to you. Yeah, yeah. And then you. Um, I think our integration was very really depends on um, how we approach this like intellectual technology journey. There's a lack of human interaction this year, but I think it's making it for us to really put ourselves into the, into the video and figure out how we're going to go ahead and collaborate with technology if not, you know, 
work with what it is that we are. So you put like three great ideas in there. So first of all, it always depends on the viewer how a, something is interpreted, right? So, so art is inherently subjective. That's one point you got to. And then how do we put ourselves into that community to work with technology is another point you made. That's fantastic, thank you. Uh, I do have to give credit to Carl Hooker and Tom Murray. Uh, I saw them uh, present that video. I'd never seen it before. So uh, they, it comes by way of them that I found it. Um, I think it is certainly a provocative uh, video. I want to get you thinking. Uh, I can't decide if the music reminds me more of Polar Express or uh, Jurassic Park. Um, so that, that's distracting me. Uh, what was the third? Edward Scissorhands. Oh, right. oh is, it, is it actually Edward Scissorhands? Oh, but it reminds you of that. You're right, it does sound like that. Now I have three to think about. Someone's hand in the back. So my daughter is 10, and I, I'll tell you this quick story, because it, it frightens me and I'm proud at the same time. She comes to me and she says, Dad, um, I need a YouTube channel. And I said, well, you're 10, you, you can't have that until a little, later, a little later. She goes, but Dad, I have a, I have a show. And I said, what's your show? And she goes, well, um, you know, Sophia down the street and I are going to do a show about American Girl dolls, right? Because they both, they both love American Girl dolls. Any American Girl doll addicts that are paying off? Okay. Just me. <laughs> Apparently. She said, uh, no, this is how it's gonna work. Like she said, sits me down. Look, I'll be on screen, and then Sophia will make the outfits that we will then, I will show on my show um, to the world, to my audience. She used the phrase, my audience. Um, and Jay, her older brother, uh, he's 15, he'll do all the editing for me. <laughs> and they go, this is great. So, um, uh, and she said, yeah, and because Sophia's shy, she doesn't wanna be on camera, I'm gonna then, uh, she's gonna give me free outfits for my doll, uh, for my dolls, in exchange for me promoting her designs to my audience. And I was like, yeah, but wait, hold on, you already, she's already giving you outfits? Oh yeah, yeah, she's making the outfits. And I'm like, I'm like you're grafting, uh, you're grifting the, the, the gal down the street already? You don't even have a YouTube channel! Like, so I was super proud of her innovative and entrepreneurialism, that she like worked out this arrangement with the neighbor girl, and then just disturbed because she did it all without actually having the show yet or an audience. Uh, you know, otherwise I like the business plan. Like, you know, ha did she have? If she had a million person audience, yeah, fantastic business plan. And, and <laughs> but uh, but anyway, yeah, I was I was horrified and proud at the same moment of my daughter and her entrepreneurialism. So speaking of that, uh, there is a website for you to look up. And good news for teachers, by the way, uh, willrobotstakemyjob.com. You go there and you type in the name, your job title. And uh, teacher is in like the low, like point something percent, uh, or like 1.2 percent or something really low. Uh, my current job, senior director of a company, is like in the teens uh, of percentages of robots taking it. Uh, for fun, you should look up, um, uh, what was some of the, travel agent is way up there. What else, what else would be super high? No cheating, no Googling right now on the website. What other job can we imagine is going away fairly quickly? Cashier, yeah. Receptionist, the person I checked in with at the hotel last night. Servers, yeah, yeah. Doctor, you should look at that. I think it's in the mids. I think it's. I think there's still something out there. But yes, you're right. I mean, that's what we saw there. Uh, so it got me thinking. Uh, and I want your thinking on this as well. There's a tool called Thought Exchange. It's free to use. You don't have to set up an account even. You can just go to this uh, bit.ly that I set up, futurejob.edu, so bit.ly slash futurejob.edu. And I'd love for you to take a moment and type in some of your thoughts about this question. What will the jobs in the future look like? What should we be preparing our students for? And uh, I have this uh, URL on the next few slides so I could go on. I did this ahead of time so I could think about that. So you'll see this screen. You'll see it, me ask that question. I don't know why it puts my name twice. And then, um, yeah, so go ahead and put your ideas in. It's bit.ly bit slash future jobs edu. Yeah. Sorry, job singular, future job edu, singular. Okay, so this is a, a, one of my favorite quotes. Alan Kay, Southern Californian. Uh, he invented the Dyna book way, way back. And uh, it was the idea that students should have a device in their hands that they get to use and, and, and it helps them personalize their learning. And oh, by the way, he did this in the 70s, right? And he's still around, he's still saying amazing things like this, the best way to create the future is to invent it. And so he did his best to do that. 
And so I started thinking about um, jobs out there that would not be replaced. And so, of course, that takes me to Kentucky Fried Chicken. Uh, why, you ask? How many of you have been to Kentucky Fried Chicken's Twitter homepage? Which looks like this. Have you noticed the odd number of people and accounts that follows? 11. Why does it only follow 11 accounts? And this, my friends, is the brilliance of a marketing genius that will not be replaced by a robot. They follow 11 accounts. They follow the five, sorry, the six, well, no, five Spice Girls and six random guys named Herb. <laughs> Right? It's brilliant. No robot is going to come up with that. Eleven herbs and spices. Or spices and herbs. Yeah, so that's what they, it's brilliant. Brilliant, right? And then they went further. There was a shortage of chicken in the UK uh, at KFC stores, and so they had to shut some of them down, right? I know, crisis. I'm glad we were here and we had our fried chicken in the United States. So they took out a full page ad in the London papers and it had a picture of an empty bucket of chicken. This is K KFC themselves took out this ad and it would never fly in the States because they replaced the letters. Instead of KFC, it said FCK. And then it said, we're sorry. And they just owned it, right? And now all the Londoners are showing each other the ad and instead of talking about how could they run out of chicken, how could they, they have one job, right? How could they screw it up? Instead of talking about that, they were saying, did you see the ad? And I only do Irish, sorry. Uh, did you see the ad? Um, it's a, it says FCK. Um, and that's what they were talking about instead. Again, brilliant, right? So those are the jobs that I think uh, are safe. And so here, I've hopefully given you enough time to put in a few ideas. We'll come back to it a little later. So feel free. But I think this may be the last slide. No, there's one more slide. Um, with the URL. If you're interested in this tool, by the way, it's kind of like a, a way that people can come in with ideas and they can be voted up or voted down by the rest of the group. Um, so if you like that approach, you can contact uh, Joe Baker at ThoughtExchange.com. It's a website that this is happening on. Uh, you can also join with the uh, text as well. So, um, And then that's what you should be seeing as you're sharing your thoughts. And then I can comment on them. Other people can vote them up, vote them down. And then if this works, this, by the way, is live slides that embeds uh, an internet uh, web page live into a keynote slide. Uh, this should be this. Yeah, so we have 47 people participating. Way to go! Yay! So we'll come back to that later. So some examples. And I love this little clip. Again, I already mentioned I have kids, so heavy viewer of Disney movies. This is a Disney TV we'll show. Except the very first episode, they didn't. They went back and fixed that later. Uh, in any case, they uh, the whole so premise. Oh, like, here's the end. Inappropriate building is unsafe and irresponsible. Uh, kids, listen to me, guys. Forget everything they told you. Creativity isn't bad. It's the best thing about you. You two can do anything, and that's why I've always been secretly proud of me and all their sister. Get her. I know what we're gonna do today. I think it's an older sister, Candace, to deliver the message, right? So I, uh, I was horrified, right? This is my life's work, right? <laughs> to, to change the way that we view school. And here we are, 2009, and Disney thinks that, yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't worked in some, some schools. So um, I don't think it was Disney completely uh, attacking education by any means. Any Disney fans, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, my, my sister works for Disney. I work for Disney. We're all good. We're all good. And I, I give you credit for this. Uh, but it, 
did get me thinking, and so I had to uh, show that to someone that talks about uh, creativity in schools. And uh, given my role, I had the opportunity to talk to this guy, and I walked up to him and I showed him the iPad. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson speaks on our schools killing creativity, and I said, you have to watch this, this clip. I thought I'll just show it. I stood there and made the poor guy watch this clip. Thankfully, he didn't ask security to hustle me away. Um, but he, he did find it was uh, compelling and funny at the same time and disturbing. So uh, it, was, it was one of those things that uh, I had the right time at the right moment. I had a device I could show him uh, and talk to him about that. He's an extraordinary wit, one of the fastest, uh, funniest guys uh, I know uh, on the planet. Uh, we, when he keynoted at the, the Q conference a couple years ago, uh, we took him out to dinner and uh, we kept talking. It was like two and a half hours. And, he was not exhausted at all. We had to get him up early the next morning for the keynote, which started at 8. And so we get back to the uh, lobby, and we say, we have a green room for you. We're going to set up some tea. Is there anything else you'd like? And he pauses to think for a moment. We all sort of subconsciously lean in, and uh, he says, yes, I would like uh, two lines of crack cocaine. <laughs> and we lost it. And uh, in the morning, um, I had 12 hours to think about a response. Uh, in the morning, I said, I'm sorry, uh, Sir Ken, we, we weren't able to uh, you know, get what you asked for, but we were able to find some heroin. And he said, fantastic, my keynote will be 15 minutes. <laughs> like that. Like that. He's super fast. So an, an example here of something that uh, I think is innovative and demonstrates this maverick leadership is, is the Student Powered Showcase. Uh, we had uh, at Q, and we still, there still is at Q, amazing innovative educators. And when Q does something new, they often ask the members, what should we do? And so there was an opportunity to reinvent the student showcase as it had previously been. It was called the technology showcase. And we wanted to put students first. And so we renamed it Student Powered Showcase. And I'm so excited that there's a student showcase here today. And I agree with Chris, you should absolutely make time and get over there. It was always my favorite part when, when I was there at the Q conference to go talk to the kids. And so I put some pictures in. Uh, they've got 3D printing, um, we gave them shirts, they gave them a day to be the presenters. And so the, at the end of a three-day event, where it was teachers talking to teachers or you know, all of us talking about it, here it was actually happening. And one of the other differences we made with the Student Power Showcase was that instead of something that was done in the past, like, hey, here's the robot I built, or here's the programming I did, or something that I learned, all past tense, it was active present tense, and so that we would ask the students to engage the passerby. Hey, here's what we're going to do. We're going to design the, the, the programming to get this robot through the maze. We are going to figure out how to you know, organize this so that the 3D printer prints what we need. We're going to answer this question about robotics. Or whatever the answer was, whatever the activity was, uh, that's the way the Student Power Showcase was built and conceived. And so I love that as an example of students, uh, or sorry, teacher creativity uh, within that context. And I put this in mostly because of his t-shirt. I just thought it was hilarious. Uh, another example, and this is from my friend Mike Morrison down in Laguna Beach. Uh, the most powerful fuel in the universe is the passion of the human spirit on fire. And so he got fired up, so to speak, about this future ready concept. And so he came up with rocket ready. And the idea in his district is to gamify professional learning. And beyond that, involve the students, right? Just as we did in that showcase. He actually has teachers work with students to solve real-world problems. And then he actually incentivizes it with money for the classroom. So if you go through this project and you accomplish certain goals, you get this much more money to spend in your classroom on resources, materials. Uh, it's all through Laguna Beach Unified. And um, he, he put together this whole program. He built it on the Aluda Learning Platform. Um, and here's just exam some examples of things that you can do that are optional to get a bonus of additional funding. Um, I think this works with things other than money. I think you can incentivize uh, with, with uh, hardware and software, with opportunities, experiences, uh, collaborations. Give a teacher a chance to go and see another classroom or go to another school and visit. That's another way you can do something that's an incentive uh, that doesn't have to involve funding. Uh, Aludo Learning, I'm going to try to stitch it together somehow, which I've done, by the way. Uh, this saves you that hassle, and I use that to build this website, this, this, this slide, rather. Uh, so they have digital badges, course catalog. They have, they have sample. Uh, games that you can use, sort of game questions that you can pop into your existing structure. So pretty neat thing. Another quick example, uh, and I know I'm moving through them quick here, but I want to make sure you all have time to go and experience all the sessions on time and the student showcase. Uh, my friend Caroline McGuire, in 2003 I met her. I was working at the Orange County Department of Education. We got word that there was a teacher of the blind and visually impaired who, were, who was making movies with her students. 
and she submitted a couple of things to, to the office. And we're like, hmm, I really don't think the blind students are making movies. Is this true? Is this really happening? How are they making movies? I think that there must be adults helping them. So I was sent out to validate uh, that this was really happening. And Caroline was there. And I got there, and I said, so tell me, how do, you, how do the students do this if they can't see screen? And now, first of all, some of the students could see. They, they were just they had visual impairments, right? They were very narrow focus of vision, it was blurry, or they were wearing glasses, they had a very thing. So some could see, and so the students with the best eyesight, they, those were the cameramen, and they put them on the camera. And then uh, the kids that were editing were editing mostly depending on their hearing. And if you know anything about video editing, oftentimes the eyes get in the way. If you listen to the audio track when you're making edits, it's actually sometimes a better edit. And so they were using that, and I said, oh, okay. So do you use like sh shortcuts on the keyboard? Because what do you mean? She said, well, we're using iMovie. And I said, okay, so do you like, like space bar to pause and play? She goes, wait, what? And I go, space bar. Like it pauses and plays the movie. That's, that's fairly standard keyboard shortcut on iMovie. And she goes, wait, hold on everyone. Kids, come here. The guy from the county is teaching us. <laughs> she had no idea uh, how to use the program. It was legitimately the students. She's like, well, I'm not a techie. She is now, by the way. But, uh, she wasn't there. She was like, I don't, I don't, that's what the kids do it. And so I went back and said, yes, this is totally legit. And I watched the movies the kids made. I got to talk to them. They had some, some amazing projects that they did. And she herself was inspired by one Hall Davidson. How many of you have seen Hall Davidson? Amazing, amazing educator and a great mentor to me. And he uh, was my predecessor, uh, the director of the California Student Media Festival. She went to the California Student Media Festival, saw it, got inspired, walked up to him at the end and said, uh, Mr. Davidson, I'm Carol McGuire. I just want to introduce myself because my students are going to win this next year. And he's like, okay, fantastic. He had no idea the students are blind and visually impaired. <laughs> and so she went back and got all fired up. And then she got tapped as an Apple Distinguished Educator, started a program called Rock Our World. It was right around when GarageBand came out. How many of you are familiar with GarageBand? Amazing new software at the time. And she met these educators through the ADE program from around the world, and she said, this is an amazing experience that I get to hang out with these, this global network of educators right here for this week. I want to extend that. I want to work, I want to hang out with these guys and gals year-round. What can we do together? And so she hit upon the idea of using GarageBand, and she's musical herself, and she would add one track in with her students. She would save that file, ship it off to some other classroom in a different country, and have them add another track. So she might do the drums, let's say. They might do do the vocals, and then they ship it off to another classroom. And it goes around eight times, and they add, you know, you might imagine keyboards, uh, other instruments, vocals, um, all the things you can imagine for a song. And by the end, you have a song that was collaborative, collaboratively created by eight different classrooms in eight different countries around the world. And then just to level up, she did it eight times, right? So she did it. Each country starts one song, and then it rotates like a clock eight times, once a, once a week. And so by the end of eight weeks, she has eight songs that have been shared with eight different countries and classrooms around the world. So they made a video. I'm going to show you a little bit of it. It's a music video, of course. It's a legit rock band here in L.A. called The Peacher Band. Super, super exotic. Tennessee? Real? Japan? China? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on just for time's sake, but I just, I'm not gonna apologize. You're gonna have that song in your head the rest of the day. It's awesome. Enjoy it. It's a great song. I have it on my set, my playlist on iTunes. No joke, I listen to it every once in a while. It's like, yeah, go, Caroline. Another example, uh, in terms of one of my favorite authors of all time, um, William Gibson is a science fiction author, and he said this quote, in various ways, by the way, so it's hard to pin him down on one version of this quote. So if you see one with slightly different words, it's also probably legit. But the one that I like the best is, the future has already arrived, it's just not evenly distributed yet. And I see that in education so much, you know, 
in the roles that I've been able to have, I get this, this rarefied air of innovative educators working with inspiring leaders to support them, and they present at events, and I get to see, see people like Carol Ann, but I know that, that that's a disparity. That's not everywhere. There's amazing pockets of innovation in education. How do we spread that? How do we make it sustainable? And so that's one of the things that we're looking at at uh, the UN. And so I was pleased to represent my country in Beijing, uh, not for the Olympics, but it's fun to say, right? <laughs> They asked me to go to a meeting and talk about the Education 2030 efforts, which is this vision of education worldwide, sponsored by UNESCO, which is the education and, and humanities side of the UN. And uh, we talked about how we can move forward on a one-to-one -one platform uh, across the globe and what that looks like. And so given the wide variance, again, back to William Gibson's quote, the wide variance of education structures across the globe, you have ministries of education that can do decisions that will affect the whole country. And then you've got the United States, which is very much local control, right? We can decide at the school district level what's going to happen. And then there's even other schools where it's at the site level. So we had to figure out what's the locus of control we could focus on worldwide that's gonna make sense. And so we went down to the classroom. And so the focus of our work is classroom one-to-one -one examples, best cases. How do you do that? How do you do that well? And then scale up from there. So how do you do it at the site level? How do you do it at the district level? How do you do it at the state and a country level? And that's the work that uh, I'm volunteering on, on this, on this uh, task force. Uh, they call it an expert group. Um, and uh, it's an amazing association of worldwide educators, great thinkers in the field of ed tech. So I, I applaud them for their vision in this. And uh, my contribution is they said, okay, we're gonna put out a, a paper, a book. And I said, okay, wait, we're talking about technology, right? Why don't we put out an app? Why don't, at the very least, it should be a searchable PDF. Or, you know, at the very least, it should be, in my mind, like a functional application that allows you to go in and type in what your situation is like and then kick it spits out the best examples of one-to-one uh, -one that are closest to your model. So we'll see, you'll see when it all comes out how, how, how successful I am in that quest. Uh, they struggle with funding, um, you know, made hard, made, made worse by the fact that the United States is no longer funding the UN, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> It's not embarrassing at all to serve in, on this committee. Uh, the, uh, so this is the best practices in mobile learning, so watch for that. It's an exciting thing that's happening right now. Okay, now I'm not letting you guys get off scot-free. This is why I've been trying to move swiftly. Um, I need you guys to get active and do something, so I'm gonna pass around some of these. We'll talk about what they are and why. So just find them from your name. Scott, I'm gonna trust you not to take all of those. Oh, there you go, pass those down. We're gonna see how far we can get with these. I'm sorry, McDonald's was only kind enough to donate as many as I was able to spend in my pocket. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you, McDonald's. I appreciate it. Yes, get my sense of humor. I love it. So Steve Jobs has the quote up on the screen here about design thinking, and it got me thinking about these. And some of you may know, so be quiet if you know about these guys. Um, but uh, I'm going to give you guys a design thinking challenge. Here's another model that we can look at uh, for design thinking. I like this one because it's got that golden ratio reference, right? Uh, but the key thing I want to think about is uh, when we really think about uh, empathize, that's it, the empathy. empathy. Uh, design at it, it, it its core, when done well, is an empathetic experience. You are imagining yourself in another person's scenario. You want ketchup for your fries. How are you going to deliver the ketchup safely without getting it on your fingers to your table so you can then use it for fries? Or you want to taste that yogurt before you commit to that yogurt as your only flavor, <laughs> right? So you want a cup to do that. Uh, any of the other uses, right? So there's lots of different uses for this type of a, a device. And so we have to empathize in that scenario, what are you going to do, what are you not going to do um, to deliver that thing? So, so I, I took that upon myself and I, I discovered like five years ago that these actually have a secret, right? Some of you probably know. They actually expand. They're built to be expanded, okay? And so you don't have to use it like it is here. And I did a super scientific experiment where I poured all the ketchup I could fit in a cup before expanding, and then I opened it up, and then I, I, I took another one and filled it up, and then I was able to double, so this is just one, who now expanded it up. And then I took another one and I poured it in there, so I have doubled the capacity. Uh, that's a 100% gain, super scientific, one data point research here. Uh, so we could get, we could realize 100% gain in the volume of condiment that you can deliver to your table without getting your fingers sticky, right? So uh, 
That's great, except what's the flaw? Has anyone figured out the flaw? It does not go back into shape. That's a great flaw. It's not the one I was looking for, but it's a great, that's a thing. How many of you, let me ask it this way. How many of you knew this when you woke up this morning? You knew that these actually expanded. Okay, because you're a sharp audience, okay? That's the flaw. Most people don't know it expands, right? You guys are an exceptional, exceptional crew. We already established that. Um, most people don't know it expands. So the failure of design isn't, uh, is in the empathy stage, right? Because when I walk up with, with my order, Right? I need to get my ketchup, and I have one hand. I don't have the hands to do this and pump the thing, right? Because I got my hands full with all my stuff. That's one reason. The other reason is it's just not clear, right? You get this in your hand, you don't know that it expands. So again, find your buddy. You can find new buddies if you want. Take 30 seconds. See if you can figure out how we could solve this design challenge and make it better so that people, when they come upon the initial cup before it's expanded, they know it expands and they can use it uh, and get that double the volume instead of using two cups, which is we agree would be bad for the environment, right? Okay, so 30 seconds, set, go. the best idea that you heard, whether it was yours or your, your partner's, shoot up a hand, what's a good idea of a way we can solve this is all design fail. Yes? Okay, a visual. Okay, hold on, so let's just unpack that first one. So you stick, put a sticker on the ketchup dispenser. I thought you were going to say on the thing itself, and I was like, well, that's just making more paper, but no, you're right. Put it on the dispenser, and it's a visual that shows, hey, this thing expands. Okay, and then the second idea. Go ahead. Well, I imagine it's shipping, right? Because if you, you get more compact, you can get more in a box, you can get more boxes in a truck, and therefore it's more compact and safe in general. Oh, okay. But then, okay, so could it just be delivered flat? That's an interesting thought. Yes, another idea. Yeah, open me up, yeah. I like that. And you just put it where, on this? No, 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 no. On the dispenser, on the okay. Open, opens, opens, okay, that's a good idea. Sort of a yes and, by the way. We'll come back to that later, yes. Others? Okay, yes. Oh, and like pop one of them? Okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. So you can't put ketchup in it until you expand it. But is that unfair? I mean, there may be a use. You only want a smidge of that ketchup. Maybe you don't want the full thing. So we're going to make the choice for them. Okay, all right. You've got to be empathetic here, right? Yes. Yes. I love that idea. I'll give you a yes and. I've done this a couple times now. Somebody, the best idea is, is that with a slight twist. Instead of actual text or words that say expand, it's an image that only makes sense when expanded. So you you, you, paint, you have this thing painted, and I actually found an example of it. Um, uh, so there was a cynical response that you guys didn't do, which I'm proud of you for. The cynical response is, who cares? We'll, we'll sell more, <laughs> right? The company is like, dude, this is brilliant. We get the benefit of everyone thinking we're smart, and then we sell more because they don't do it. 
That's a cynical response. The environmental response is we got to fix this because it's selling more. It's not on native because we could use more. And then the design thinking response, which you guys went to, which I'm super proud of. But no, look, here's the thing. There's actually uh, someone that has printed designs on them. Now, there could be an environmental damage here because of the color and the pigment I, uh, I acknowledge. But if you put a design on there, it only makes sense when you expand it. It sort of gets that, that right brain going, oh, I should be doing something here because the, the design doesn't make sense until I expand it out. Okay, so um, we're down to the last few minutes here. I have one more thought, um, and this is something I wrote about. Uh, my son came to me a few years ago. This is, this is uh, a while ago. He's 15 now. And he said, hey, Dad, do you have Adobe After Effects? And I do. So I said yes. But the next thing I followed up with, you can probably guess, is I do, but I, I, don't, I don't know how to use it. <laughs> I, can't, I can't show you how to use it. I know it's cool. Uh, maybe we can learn together. He goes, oh, no, that's fine. And he goes away. He takes my laptop. <laughs> and he comes back. 20 minutes later, he comes back. He goes, Dad, Dad. So I go, yeah. He goes, What's a keyframe? And I was like, oh, okay, vocabulary. And I know this. So I tell him what a keyframe is, right? Because I know that. And he goes, okay, and he goes away. <laughs> and then he comes back, uh, and he had learned, he taught himself through YouTube how to create uh, um, a frame by frame uh, rotoscope animation. If you learn with rotoscope, it's when you take the human body and you sort of draw over it, or you keep a shape and you draw over it. They did it with the Lord of the Rings, uh, you know videos back in the 70s and 80s. Um, it was all rotoscope animation, so it looked realistic and super cool. Uh, anyway, he did that to create four-point uh, rotoscope lightsaber effects, um, and he did a test. He shot like a four-second clip of himself swinging around, you know, the hilt of a lightsaber with the green plastic extended, just to test it. And then pain, painstakingly, frame by frame, then swapped out the green of the plastic with an actual glow of a lightsaber. Taught himself, didn't need my help, except for the vocabulary, which I think is interesting. As an English teacher, I thought that was interesting. Uh, and then he just, and then so then he creates this, and I have to show. This is my excuse to slip in uh, both my kids to my keynote. Revenge of the Sith. Turns. It's almost done. I like how he gives the Sith Lord to his sister, and he's the hero. to be involved. He has to include bloopers. Uh, and uh, did you notice the Wilhelm scream in there? Any film buffs that recognize the Wilhelm scream? That's the scream that was used by a character named Wilhelm in a movie in the 50s, a, a, a country western movie. And uh, it's been used and reused and reused. You can hear it in the Star Wars movies as well, so there's a long history if you Google Wilhelm scream. That's the only part I get, I get any credit on. Uh, why do I try? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so coming back, I want to I wanna check out how your thoughts have been working out on, the, uh, on this thing right here and see how we did on the future jobs activity. So hopefully it's loading. Um, Still just so excited that this thing works this way. Uh, there's the mouse. Okay, there we go. Sorry, you have to go to the bathroom. Hang on. So here, this is what you can go through the star. So let's go see some examples here. Um, 
got a little bit of a chance of losing human interaction and related skills. so it links back to what i was talking about in terms of empathy and how it's the first step in design thinking and that's why i think that's so crucial so that's so i like that so i'm going to start that one up that's distressing that this view of the future still includes inequality inequality yeah that is distressing so we as a society should be preparing our students to work towards that that an easy grader obviously jobs in the future will have coding involved their students need to be prepared i'm gonna give them four just because they didn't add anything else because i can't answer it heavily depend on technology to compete so in any case you get the idea how this this works and if you go through i love the ideas too that, that we're thinking about the, the thoughts that you guys have been able to come up with and there'll be a need for those who fix create or program machines for work and life we need to give students an opportunity to learn how to do this yay okay so so hopefully this has been able to give you some thoughts uh some ideas of, to think about in the future as we move forward uh the last thing i'll suggest and i don't have a slide for this but um i'm very strong on and actually have a talk i give about reclaiming the teacher's lounge and i find that far too often in our world of innovation the teacher's lounge is a place we look at it as a refuge right it's a place where we can go and we can sort of vent uh, but it has a tendency to become this negative space i, I joke that it's a it's a place where good ideas go to die right and perhaps it's a little negative of a view i admit but you know it comes from experience that story i told you about carol ann when she got all fired up at the media festival she went back she told her students we're going to make a video and they said yeah this is why we make videos and they start brainstorming about who's going to have what roles and what they wanted to do the video about and then the bell rang and where did she go teacher's lounge she went to the teacher and said oh my gosh did i tell you about this thing i went to this weekend it was called the media festival i got all fired up and we're going to make a video in my class and they were like carol ann you kids are boring you can't do video in your class how, you're going to disappoint them it's going to be terrible like how could you do that to them and she said oh you're right i forgot that my kids are boring and she, <laughs> she really said that <laughs> i just add that for that joke she's like oh, you're right i really i shouldn't put this expectation on i'm asking too much of my kids i'm putting them in a spot where they will fail and i will as a teacher have failed them so she goes back she says kids i'm sorry we can't do the video i just where I don't want to do that. And they're like, no, we have to. And so thankfully they convinced her yes to do it. And the rest is history. She made videos. They won. They did go back. They won the festival the next year. So that teacher's lounge idea then became, I would encourage folks like you that, that come on a Saturday and learn about how to be innovative in your classroom. I would say, you know what? Just avoid the teacher's lounge. Stay away. <laughs> right? Eat lunch in your room with kids or go somewhere else or don't eat lunch. You know, teach six periods and get the extra 20%. <laughs> I, <laughs> I said awful things, uh, and I realized that too is wrong. We are ceding that territory too easily. We are giving up on a space that could be supported and positive. And I know it is, and I don't mean to generalize. I know there are fantastic teachers' lounges out there, and I know there are interactions that are positive. But I feel that as a whole, we allow it to become too negative. We allow it to be a sterile space. Instead, I would challenge you to reclaim that teacher's lounge, make it a place of innovation, make it a place of supporting each other. That thing that happened just when we were talking about the design, you came up with an idea and you added to it, right? That's called plussing. In theater, we call that yes and. It's, it's the cornerstone of improv. And I grew up in the theater, so you'll forgive me for that reference, but it is absolutely valid here. And as educators, if we can plus each other, if we can go, that's a great idea. And you know what else? We could do this. It's a yes and. It should be a yes and space. It should be a space that we protect as a teacher and that we keep for each other to share and support. And yes, you could go and have, have drinks after school and, and vent, but let's use the teacher's lounge as a supportive space, a positive space, a space of encouragement and that yes and lead learner spirit. So with that, I, I, I thank you for your time and I thank you for playing along with me and laughing. Uh, have a great day. And I will give it back to Chris. Thank you. Welcome.